raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our very favorite corner of the Crosstime Pub. And of course, while we look to the past, we also keep an eye on the future and where new kinds of intelligence, perhaps artificial intelligence, may be taking the field of archaeology in the days and years ahead. Exciting times, and of course, as always, joining me right here in the Crosstime Pub, my cohort, my comrade, my colleague, Mr. Jason Pentrail. Sir, how are you? Well, I am uh, buried in books, but ready for summertime adventure. That's right, it's heating up, the school year is coming to an end, and it's time to uh, get out there on the road and have a few adventures. I would say so. You know, we're long overdue, and actually, I mean, I've been spending so much time on the road over the last year or so, I really need some time off. But I was recently in Washington, D.C. I was up there in Ohio before that. No, after that. But I got to go back to Ohio, and of course, we have a lot of fond memories about Ohio. You know, when you spend as much time on the road as guys like us do, pursuing our many interests, when you have a day off... If you ever have a day off, here is what you do. You sit in your kitchen like I did, and you rewire a Stratocaster. That's how I spent my 40th birthday this year, because let me tell you, folks, I don't get many days off. And I had to promise myself I would take my 40th birthday off. So as I brought in a brand new decade of my life, I rewired my Stratocaster. Now, it sounds incredible. I've put these Eric Johnson pickups in there. And man, it really sounds like a vintage Strat. The problem is, though, that after I did some fret work, it actually buzzes more than it did before I started doing that fret work. And so I've got to go back through. I may end up doing an entire refret on this guitar. The Strat, I love to play it, but it's been a kind of like a hobby guitar for me now for the better part of the last decade. But I really want to get it playing right. And if you want to do that, it can take a little time. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, as a collector and dealer of fine instruments myself, um, I can tell you that uh, building a guitar is, is fun, but it's very, very hard to get it dialed in unless you are a professional. Uh, now, I do have to tell you this. Uh, you know, I've had many Les Pauls over the years. Um, I've had everything from 59 reissues to customs to studios, uh, standards, everything in between. And, you know, I just couldn't get over the fact that I didn't have my Les Paul custom. So with that being said, I sold off everything in order to finance the one that I've always wanted. And now I finally have a flame top wine, gold hardware, Les Paul custom shop custom. Well, that's, and, okay. yeah, that's great news, but now hold on. You sold off everything. You got rid of all the Telecasters. No, I kept the Esquire. Uh, one Telecaster, and then I also have a blinging gold SG standard. Oh. Uh, and, uh, now, you and I have talked about SGs, but this one's really cool, and I really do enjoy playing. It's lightweight. It's fun to play. But, yeah, now that I have the anchor of my collection, I have my Les Paul custom back, the one that I've always wanted in the color that I've always wanted. And, man, it screams. It's so good to have that guitar back where it belongs here in the studio. Yeah, no, I love those Les Pauls. You'll also be happy to know, even though this is also a project guitar, I now also have a Telecaster-style guitar, but it's not really a new acquisition. This is one that I had years ago. I actually did a couple of recordings with this guitar. It's an old Tele that had an old Tele neck that started having issues, and so I put a Mighty Might neck on it, and I rewired the thing, used it for years, and then just wasn't playing it much, and a friend offered to buy it, so I sold it to him. And uh, then, you know, after he actually dropped by and saw the Strat in process, he says, you know, I never played that Telecaster. I'm just going to bring it back to you. Consider this your late 40th birthday gift from me, Mike. And so he gives me this Telecaster, and now I'm in the process of going back through that thing. Uh, the fret job is just fine on it. 
like it was when I sold it years ago, but now I got to get the electronics right. So, you know, it's always a work in process. Yeah, but it's fun and it's good work. And you, you play so well that, uh, you can, you can certainly tell more than most people what the guitar actually needs. So I used to fancy myself a bit of a luthier, but anyway, we can talk about the archeology span of instruments all day, getting into some actual archeology span news here. You may have seen this one that just today in the journal nature, there was a really big story that dropped, and I'm going to quote here from the New York Times coverage of this just from a few hours ago. Scientists, they say, have revealed a surprisingly complex origin of our species, rejecting the long-held argument that modern humans arose from just one place in Africa during one period in time. Now, before we took to the mic, I briefed you briefly on this, and, you know, we had kind of given each other the proverbial wink. This isn't all that surprising to me. But I know there are a lot of career anthropologists out there. With respect to all of our friends in the career uh, out there who listen to this program, many of you, of course, who have been following this story and you're like, this is big news. You know, I see it as big news also. But I don't think probably I am as surprised by this as many in the field probably are. And one reason being that I guess in the diverse areas that we work with Seven Ages and the many areas of anthropology that we cover, you know, one thing I have had to get used to is, first of all, getting my mind blown, but second of all, having to change my mind about my old ideas. And really, this is something that even in my science reporting in my day job, I've had to get used to mostly covering astronomy, physics and defense and things like that. There's always going to be some development that upsets what you think you thought you knew, disruptive technology or innovations, scientific discoveries. So this one is kind of one of those, Jason, where we're having to rethink old paradigms again. And just quoting again briefly from this article, and then I want your thoughts here. They note that by analyzing the genomes of 290 living people, researchers concluded that modern humans descended from at least two populations that coexisted in Africa for a million years. That's right, a million years before merging in several independent events across the continent. Again, you can read all about this in the journal Nature. We'll have that linked in the show notes. But again, this is a great setup for something else we're going to be discussing today because Wow, we couldn't go to Africa. You know, we couldn't jump in our TARDIS. We couldn't travel back in time. We couldn't actually see what's happening there, per se, with genetic science and the advances that we're seeing in that field. It's helping archaeologists really take on a much clearer understanding of human evolution and origins. And this is an exciting time for that. Jason, I'm really eager to get your thoughts. Well, you know, as you said, it's in keeping with conversations that we have all the time. You know, every year we're seeing exponential growths in technology and the advancement of the way we can analyze different things, whether it be DNA, whether it be uh, relic populations, whatever it is, every single year it's getting more and more in depth. It's getting better. It's getting highly refined. And so I honestly expect to see big changes to the narrative in all of these things across uh, not just, you know, human story, but, you know, as we see with non-invasive technologies within archaeology, things like LIDAR, ground penetrating radar, all the things that are every year getting better with the technology and more and more refined, these type of discoveries really don't surprise me as much as they may uh, surprise someone who doesn't live in this world. And so as we, you know, push forward each year, um, you know, 10 years, think about the technology a decade from now what they'll be able to discover, what they'll be able to uh, go back and rewrite, you know, and we should constantly be updating that narrative. It's the way that we move forward. You know, it's the beauty of science. Of course, we always want to take these things with a grain of salt. We want to check the data. We want to recheck the data. We want to make sure that we're uh, reporting these things accurately. Uh, but, you know, as we move forward, as I said, uh, these things will be refined to the point to where uh, it's going to be trustworthy data and something that we, uh, you know, can use to rewrite the history. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. And yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, Mike, along those lines, uh, I have a story for this episode that's uh, very, very similar to that. Now, this is coming from science.org, originally coming from the journal Nature as well. So Nature, as they always are, right on top of these things. Taking is, center stage today, aren't they, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, that was completely accidental. But nonetheless, we've got a lot of big stories. And so this one is coming uh, again from science.org, written by Ann Gibbons, uh, with the title, Who Wore This Ancient Deer Pendant? DNA Reveals a Stone Age Woman with Surprising Origins. 
Pioneering technique allows scientists to read genetic traces of an artifact's last user. Now, before we get into the details of this, Micah, how many times have we had that very conversation? When you're on an archaeological site, when you're on an excavation, and you hear everybody stop and they run over because somebody has found something, and you go back to your room that night, or you go back to your cabin, where your tent, wherever you're at, and inevitably the topic comes up of who was the last person to touch this? Who was the last person to wear this? And, you know, you just sort of go through your imagination, go through the what ifs, but apparently they have figured out a non-destructive way to extract DNA from these type of artifacts, which is something that they've been working on for years now. And they are able to kind of focus in on this one particular piece which is phenomenal. So 20,000 years ago, someone dropped a deer tooth pendant in a cave in southwestern Siberia, where it lay until archaeologists excavated it in 2019. Now researchers have caught a glimpse of its last wear. Now this is coming from Max Planck, so if you're familiar with them, you know that they're usually on top of these type of things. Uh, this is particularly coming from the Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, or EVA. Now they've developed a way to extract DNA that's embedded in the artifact's porous surface by sweat and skin cells. This particular team, uh, their lead researcher, Elena Essel, has created this new way of doing it. So a quote, it says, it's the first time to my knowledge that we've had a non-destructive way to extract DNA from paleolithic artifacts. Now the technique promises a window into how and by whom ancient ornaments and tools were used. Human DNA gleaned from their surfaces could offer new insight into cultural practices and social structure in ancient populations, says evolutionary biologist Beth Shapiro of the University of California at Santa Cruz. Now, Here's the history here. Geneticists have tried for 20 years to extract human DNA from Stone Age tools, ornaments, and other artifacts. But although they can get ancient human DNA from things like bones, teeth, hair, and sometimes even from sediments, they have always failed with the artifacts uh, more than a few hundred years old. So going back for more than just two or three hundred years, they haven't been able to do this successfully. Now, working in the lab of the EVA biochemist Mathis Meyer, uh, and Essel took up the challenge back in 2017 as part of her thesis. She and Meyer reasoned it should be possible to coax out that ancient human DNA from tools made of porous bone or teeth. And that's exactly what we see here. After five years of trial and error with different chemicals and methods, the team found that submerging an entire artifact in a mild sodium phosphate buffer bath while slowly heating it from room temperature to more than 90 degrees Celsius was the best method. This released the ancient DNA that was trapped in that bone, gradually starting the DNA on the surface and ending with DNA from deeper with inside that bone matrix while leaving the artifact's surface unharmed. She says it's like a washing machine. The higher temperatures are used for bigger stains, which is a very interesting way to put it that I think everybody can relate to. So this method, method worked on several test materials, um, but it failed when Essel applied it to tool sites that were coming out of Europe, where ancient humans and Neanderthals both lived at the same time. So she hoped to learn which kind of human DNA made the sophisticated artifacts, but the tools were either contaminated by modern human DNA or they came from soils that contained substances that suppressed the enzymes. However, after this trial and error and using this new method, it appears to work really well, clearly, and they're able to define the DNA that is uh, there. now. You may have heard this term, you may have heard this location before. Now, what's also interesting about this story is this particular artifact is coming from the Denisova cave or the Denisovian cave that we've heard so much talk about over the years for various reasons. But again, it's one of those rare artifacts that is sort of locked in time there at that well-known cave, that well-known site. And to just have a little bit further insight into who was wearing it, is uh, fascinating. Now, it was a female human who they have determined came from a area that was far to the east of the cave. And so far, that's about as close as they've been able to hone in on it. But fascinating nonetheless. I agree 100%. And I'm sure that there will be additional forthcoming discoveries, not only from Denisova Cave, but also just with relation to this kind of these new processes that are being employed that are broadening our understanding of the past and ancient people who hail from those eras through DNA. 
You know, another era, by the way, that we are entering is uh, the non-human intelligence era. And I'm not talking about space aliens or something like that. I'm talking about artificial computer intelligence. And very much in line with what you're describing right there, Jason, it's going to be really interesting in the years ahead to see how this really begins to reshape and maybe expand our existing understanding of the past. Quick example of what I'm talking about. We had the Jerusalem Post reporting in recent days about new findings that were published in the journal PNAS Nexus, which involved the translation of Akkadian script into English. Now, of course, language scholars for quite some time have been capable of doing this, but as you can imagine, Jason, it is a laborious process. Enter AI, and now artificial intelligence is able to do this with, with relative ease. And this is just probably one of the many ways that we are really seeing the AI revolution, which, by the way, I do have some concerns about. I think almost everybody does right now. But it is, in the present moment, expanding our human capabilities, and certainly, as this story shows, helping us learn some things about the past. But it, this is just one example. Again, there was this article also over at verdict.co.uk, which actually reported on an MIT News article. But they're talking about how the city of Pompeii right now is actually benefiting from a four-legged robotic dog, they call it Spot, that is helping to secure the famous site. But some 50 kilometers away, an entirely sunken city, Bayi, is using AI to support a network of acoustic modems and underwater wireless sensors that help capture environmental data and transmit it to land in real time. So you can essentially study this ancient sunken site, which is adjacent to Pompeii, not only with the help of these sunken sensors, but also the extra level of knowledge that AI is providing about it. I can only imagine, really, in the years ahead, how many different ways AI might be used in the furtherance of our knowledge of the past. You know, looking at genetic science, looking at things like LIDAR, right? And how much LIDAR and satellite data is providing about archaeological sites, even those which weren't previously known. Remember back in the day when a camera hooked up to a balloon was used for aerial reconnaissance? Now, you know, somebody can log on and they can look at LIDAR data, much of which is already existing online, and you can spot archaeological sites. Remote sensing, ground penetrating radar, all these kind of technologies have made innovations in the field that actually remove, in many instances, the necessity for actual excavation. But imagine what AI, what level AI is going to add to all that. Jason, I'm, again, interested in getting your thoughts, because, of course, there will be a lot of pros in the years to come, but... There are also those concerns many are raising about AI and what it could mean for humankind, which is so inherently a study that archaeology is really aimed at doing, studying humans and our history on this planet. Yeah, good points all around. You know, as we move forward, you know, AI is one of those kind of unknowns at this point. We're seeing a rapid expansion of, of programs coming out of available AI to the public. I know everybody's on all these different ones right now, uh, typing questions in, having conversations. Uh, but then you have someone like an Elon Musk who warns against it to a certain degree. Uh, but then when we look at it from history and from archaeology, uh, for one thing, it's securing archaeological interests and jobs for the future. However, it's also changing the way that archaeology is obviously going to be done. Uh, but one thing that we saw for sure just a couple years ago with that LIDAR data that came out of Guatemala was 60,000 plus new Mayan sites that were discovered with that one sweep over the jungle. Now, that's great because that's, you know, infinite amount of years for archaeologists uh, to study and and to build the story of what we thought we knew. Um, and it's also exposing things that we never would have dreamed of. So oftentimes, scholars, researchers, and people in this field think they've got it all figured out, right? We've read what we need to read. We've done some excavations. We know what to expect from these sites. And then something like LIDAR comes along, something like AI comes along, and it rewrites everything that we thought we knew. And we see that we only knew a very minute portion of what was actually there to see. Now, with what we're talking about with the translation of these cuneiform tablets and everything, now, I don't know that most people really realize how many thousands of these things have been found over the years. 
uh, throughout Mesopotamia, that whole area, literally thousands are just sitting there waiting to be translated. And unfortunately, there is a very minute amount of people who have the expertise to sit down and translate one of these. It's very slow. It's labor intensive. And a lot of times these cuneiform texts, you know, everybody thinks it's going to be some uh, massive reveal about the origins of humans or something like that. And oftentimes it's something that's an insight to the daily life. It could be a receipt for something. It could be a simple letter between, uh, you know, a couple or them and their child or an order to a local merchant for things that they need for their home. But I think that's just as interesting because you're getting to see how these people lived, what they ate, what they bought, what they purchased. And that also gives us further insight to the daily lives of what these people were doing. And really that's, you know, the whole point of anthropology and and archeology span is to learn more about what it was like to live during that time. And so we, uh, if you really wanna get into this, please look up some of these articles because it'll really break down how they were able to train these AIs to do this and how um, they're able to break down the information and translate it. And it really gets into the details of how it's done, but I think it's amazing. And I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the information that comes out of those translations in the future. Oh, absolutely. And of course, I'm looking forward to this forthcoming conversation with Mark Hill. But before we get into all that, let's talk a minute about what's going on over on the Seven Ages Patreon. Well, Patreon's continuing to roll on. And again, we thank everyone who is out there supporting us on Patreon. We are continuing to see our numbers grow and we're putting out the Cross Time Pub, also the Digging Deeper podcast. And we're getting a lot of good reactions to the Green Dragon Book Club. We've just concluded our first book there and we have a brand new one getting ready to start this month. So if that sounds like something you would be interested in, Hop on over there and check it out. Again, we have a lot of your favorite guests that's been here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, and we also have uh, a great selection of brand new guests that you have never heard from before, probably on any podcast. And so we're having a great time doing that. Uh, It's been a great support for for us and for everything that we do. And, uh, you know, Micah, before we wrap up and get into the interview, I have one more quick announcement Uh, If you've been listening to the Patreon show or if you've even listened to the main show, you will have heard us mention a listener named Charles Reese, and uh, he started his career into anthropology and archaeology in part due to this podcast. And I just want to announce that he has just graduated from college with his degree, his uh, undergraduate degree, and he has been accepted into a master's program for anthropology and archaeology, and he will be starting that soon. So I want to give a big heartfelt congratulations to Charles Reese and also to his father, who is also a great supporter of everything we do here at Seven Ages. So thank you both for your support over the years, and we certainly want to send a heartfelt congratulations to our supporter and friend, Charles Reese. Congratulations. We're so proud of you. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. I mean, that barely says it enough. I mean, this is incredible news. Charles has been with us really since the beginning. He began his own archaeological journey and told us about that, and that coincided with us doing our podcast. He had mentioned that he'd been inspired somewhat by what we're doing Obviously, there's a whole lot more than just our little podcast that's driving that. But whatever part we played in that, we are absolutely thrilled. And Charles, congratulations, my man. We are so proud of you for sticking it out and for being one of those young people in this world who has continued to help us set the pace for the future of innovation and discovery. We are so thrilled. And again, we hope maybe to catch up with you at some point. Maybe you can come and visit us here in the Cross Time Pub But of course, we wish you all the best as you continue your education and congratulations on this incredible achievement. That's fantastic news. And as we pick up the interview tonight, I'm excited to tell you about Mark Hill, again, from Ball State University. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about the Hope Well. Now, that's something we've mentioned a lot here on the show. Everybody's interested in the beautiful earthworks and the incredible artifacts and the artistry that the Hope Well have. But tonight we are going to talk about that long distance trade and those social networks. Now, one of the most interesting things about the Hope Well is their use of copper, their use of exotic materials from all over North America. And we're going to get Mark's in insights into what he believes is the driving force behind those long distance trading goods. So a fascinating conversation coming up here tonight with Mark Hill on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.
Tonight, we are speaking with Dr. Mark Hill, professor of anthropology at Ball State University. Dr. Hill's research interests include prehistoric exchange systems, social networks and gift economies, development of regional systems of interaction, hunter-gatherers and early horticulturalists of the upper Midwest, Great Lakes, and northern Great Plains, lithic analysis, archaeological chemistry, heritage resource management, and several other associated disciplines, many of which we will address here tonight. Dr. Hill, thank you for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So many times we were out there looking for new guests and new voices, and I was uh, very happy to run across a recent article here that popped up on my feed. Uh, it was through an affiliate of NPR, and it was called Scientists Are Tracing How Materials from Other Places Ended Up in Hopewell Culture Artifacts, and that was written by Ann Thompson. And so uh, as it came across my feed, I immediately clicked on it because that's something that we've discussed several times here on the show, but we've never had an expert or someone with your uh, your background that really really uh, focuses on this type of thing. And so it's a, a great thrill for us to have you here tonight and really be able to get into the details of this fascinating topic. Well, thank you. I want to take a moment to get to know our guest a little bit better and introduce him uh, to the listeners here. So for those uh, out there listening, we have, uh, again, Dr. Hill from Ball State University, but he's got a wide range of interests and lots of experience. And so we're going to start with the beginning of your career. Oftentimes, we see people enter into college. And some of the people we speak to have that passion for history, archaeology, anthropology, and they know that that's what they've wanted to do forever. And other people discover it as they move into college and find that they really have an interest. So let's begin there. For you, why anthropology and archaeology? Well, I'm one of the latter group. I did not, um, I did not come into college thinking that's what I wanted to do. In fact, I really didn't know much about it. Looking back on it, I, I can recall looking at um, as a as a teenager and uh, and maybe earlier being fascinated by you know books that ultimately were about archaeology. But I never really, I was not aware of that as a as a as a real field of uh, real study. Um, until I got to college, and uh, I, I had a couple different routes into, into anthropology and archaeology, but one of them was one day I found some, some artifacts eroding out of a, a stream bed, and I was advised to go take them to the, uh, a neighbor who actually was the, the chair of the Department of Anthropology at, at, the, at the University of Iowa, where I was a, a student. And uh, so I took them there, and she looked at them, and we talked about them for a while. And over the course of that conversation, I, f- I found myself getting more and more interested. And she said, well, if you're interested in this, take it and take a class. So I did, and I never looked back. Changed my major, just fell in love with the field, changed my major, knew that this is something that uh, I just didn't want to stop doing. And opportunities just kept coming my way to to keep doing it. So it was it was uh, once I really discovered it as a as a real field of of work, which I think too is you know it, it's something for a lot of people. It is a real profession. There are jobs. <laughs> people do this, and there are a lot of archaeologists. So it, 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 you may not be aware of it uh, uh, at your local high school, but uh, it, it is a real thing. So yeah, I'm one of those folks that came into it sort of through the back door. I, I, I discovered my passion for it sort of accidentally, and, and I'm very glad that I did. Well, absolutely. And, you know, so many people, I think, as you said there, Dr. Hill, they don't realize that this uh, is a true profession and it's a growing science, something that every year is changing with a lot of technology and a lot of advances. Oh, and absolutely. we'll Yeah, we'll certainly get into some of that tonight because I know that's a big part of your research. But also, I think a lot of people may not realize how diverse the job field is when it comes to archaeology. Uh, A lot of people uh, might think that you just work at a university or a museum or something like that. But there's all sorts of jobs uh, from CRM to uh, university positions to research positions, all sorts of different things. And you started your career with the USDA Forest Service. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So tell us a little bit about that and how that works as far as archaeology goes. Well, federal agencies are, uh, such as the Forest Service and the Park Service and the Bureau of Land Management and, and, and others, especially federal agencies that manage land and properties, 
uh, have a, uh, a requirement under uh, a number of laws to identify and manage what the law refers to as historic properties. And that includes things like archaeological sites and historic buildings. And uh, heck, even the Lewis and Clark Trail is, is one of them that I was, that I was involved in. So uh, a number of uh, different kinds of, uh, of resources that are out there, historic resources that are, that are on federal lands. And as a result, they have a number of archaeologists uh, that work for these federal agencies. So back in uh, a long time ago, uh, I, I started with the Custer National Forest, which was um, at the time a sprawling national forest with lots of grasslands. They've since divided it up because it was so big, but uh, based out of Montana. And uh, I had the greatest job in the world. It's out doing surveys, finding sites every day. Uh, and I still say that was the best job, the greatest job I've ever had. Uh, I, I couldn't do it today because it's a very physical job, and I think I'm probably <laughs> past my prime. But um, at the time, I, it was just amazing, amazing job. And I've found sites all the time, and I, I, this is something I want to keep doing. So I ended up working for the Forest Service. I left the Custer after a few years and uh, went to uh, the Ottawa National Forest in Michigan. Uh, which is up uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan um, on the south shore of Lake Superior. And uh, I was there for a number of years uh, running what they call the, uh, was, uh, uh, the Heritage Program Manager for the Ottawa National Forest for many years. And uh, that's where I discovered really my interest in copper was when I was there because the, that's a, a, the, one of the major source areas for copper is there in the Upper Peninsula and the Lake Superior region. And uh, there was actually a site that I was working on where a, a lot of copper artifacts were coming out. And I was wondering, where is this Where is this copper coming from and where is it going? And I can recall that that is actually the, the beginning of my interest in both exchange networks and in copper. So, yeah, I, I worked for the Ottawa for a, a long time. Finally took a promotion out west and went to, uh, to Idaho where I worked on the, I managed the heritage programs for the Clearwater and Nez Perce National Forests in Idaho and uh, spent a few, a few years out there before finally uh, deciding it was time to go back to academia. Oh, and going, getting back to one of your earlier points too, most archaeologists do not work in universities. Over 90% of all archaeologists in, in North America work outside of academic context. They work in uh, cultural resource management. Most of them work in cultural resource management. Um, some work in museums. Many work in federal agencies. So most do not work in academic settings. It was only after I'd been through about half my career before I said, you know, I think I've learned a lot, and I have a lot of questions that I want to answer. So I think uh, it's time to... Uh, to move on to that step where I can, I can start to start to research some of these things that, uh, that interest me. And uh, instead of managing these sites, I can start to add to our understanding of them a little bit better. Well, absolutely. You know, and that's a, a great place to end up because again, you've had all these years of experience. And uh, of course, as we all tend to get older, we can't necessarily do the things that we used to do. And now you talked a little bit about the physicality of the job working for the forest services, but uh, let's get a little bit more into that briefly. So uh, along with the, the constant movement and the physical side of it, what would you say were some of the challenges of, of working in that environment on a daily basis? Well, if you're working for a federal agency, they are not there as, uh, uh, as agencies to manage archaeological resources alone. Right. So there's a lot of work that you have to do to uh, plan and uh, work with other disciplines to achieve multiple objectives. So uh, you can't go into that kind of situation and say, well, I'm here to just do this one thing. You have to be prepared to sit down and talk to uh, wildlife managers and fisheries folks and people who are concerned about soil erosion and, and transportation systems and, of course, uh, silviculture and forestry. Um, so all of those things have to work together. So it's, it's a matter of um, working as a member of a team 
but the rest of your team, you are the sole representative for that, for that archaeological resource and for the historic resource. But your goal is more of a multidisciplinary and a, a kind of um, task that you're working on. So that's one of the challenges. You can't just come out and say, I'm just here for this, because you're not. You're here to be a member of a team and to represent the interest of one of the resources, but to work together. So that's... That's one of the challenges. Uh, you mentioned the physicality. Certainly, it is a very, it's a physical job, uh, at least earlier in your career. It's a physical job. Uh, it tends to get less physical, more sedentary <laughs> as you go on because you spend a lot more time in meetings than you do in the field. But uh, early in your career, it is a very physical job and can be quite tiring um but it's 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 fun i mean it's a good tired you're in right. the day and you're you're exhausted but uh you, you had a, a blast right you just had the, the best time and this is i remember specifically a case from the custer national forest i was out working one day and i just looked up and looked around and said they pay me for this <laughs> <laughs> right yeah no, I understand. I understand. It's not work when it's something you love is what right, they say, right? right? Yeah, well, it's so, great. But yeah, I think, you know, working for federal agencies or working for any agency, if you're an agency archaeologist, if you're, a, I, I did do CRM, there was a brief two-year period in there that I kind of skipped over where uh, a couple of years, several years, actually, before I went to the Forest Service, I worked for the, uh, briefly for the state archaeologists of Iowa. And then um, there was a two-year stint in there where I did uh, cultural resource management down in southern Illinois. So I, I certainly had probably a good, a good solid three years early on in my career of just doing CRM before I went to the federal agency. Uh, that's a very physical job, and there are a lot of demands on both your time and uh, and your attention in those kind of positions that uh, you're trying to get a lot of work done quickly, but you also need to do it very efficiently and ethically. There are a lot of ethics involved in CRM too that uh, that have to weigh on your on your minds because you're you're dealing with uh, um, oftentimes other people's heritage. Absolutely, and, yeah, and and there's a, a real concern there that you must uh, must be aware of. So, yeah. Yeah, great point. And so, again, fascinating. I think that's important to include in the conversation, Dr. Hill, because we do have a lot of uh, college students that listen to the program. And I think getting insight from people who have had various backgrounds in the world of anthropology and archaeology is always a benefit uh, for our listeners and certainly interesting for everyone else. Now, the primary uh, reason for having you on the show tonight is to talk about the Hopewell culture and the way that they import uh, so many exotic materials materials into their artistic works, into their culture. And again, having spent some time up that way throughout the Ohio River Valley, I've spent some time speaking with Dr. Bradley Lepper and Mm -hmm. uh, getting his insights on some of the things there. One of my favorite places to go just because it's so rich with archaeology and I plan to go back there uh, very soon. But uh, the Hopewell culture is one of those, the Adena, Fort Ancient, all of those associated cultures up there. They they really... uh, they have so much to learn about. They have so many artifacts, so many uh, mounds, so many sites, uh, and they were so involved in that area that it's it just makes it like a wonderland for archaeology. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, when I was perusing your personal website, I saw something called the exchange theory, and I've heard pieces and parts of it before, but I'd never really seen it sort of laid out in detail. So as we get into the movement of these goods and uh, where they begin and their origin and ultimately where they end up, uh, before we get to that conversation, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about exchange theory and kind of how you ended up focusing on this as one of your primary research areas. So when we say exchange theory, uh, what exactly are we talking about there? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I worked in the upper peninsula of Michigan for many years and where, where a lot of this copper that is flowing through Hopewell networks originates. And I recall thinking, well, I don't see any real strong presence of Hopewell up here. There, there isn't a lot of Hopewellian influence uh, at the time in, in the Upper Peninsula. There certainly is a real lack of clear Hopewell artifacts. I can think of maybe one or two that might have made their way up there. And, and we're talking 
things like a little blade, not not a, an elaborate artifact. So the, at the time, the the dominant model of how Hopewell were obtaining all of this stuff was that people were going long distances and obtaining it and taking it back to Ohio or Illinois, if in the case of Illinois Hopewell or whichever Hopewell Center we're talking about, but certainly Ohio is a very uh, prominent one. And I just didn't see a, a strong support for that kind of model in the archaeology that I was seeing up there. So that got me thinking about, well, how do materials move in these social contexts? Uh, and I, I looked into um, you know, a lot of uh, theory on on things like exchange and social interaction, which of course takes you to folks like Marcel Mauss and um, and uh, Levi Strauss and Claude Levi Strauss and some others who you know, read read these sorts of uh, um, theoretical approaches to exchange, which started me thinking, you know, what we're looking at. And I did my dissertation research on this as well, period a little bit earlier than Hopewell, roughly equivalent to early Adena, um, but it was up in the Upper Great Lakes rather than Adena in the Ohio Valley. And what I was seeing was really the development of networks. The same way that we develop social networks today, you, you go to a conference and you meet somebody, right? You exchange business cards or these days, you, 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 know, you scan each other's phones and exchange contact information. And, and you build these professional networks that um, help you to pursue the interests that you have as a, as a researcher and as, a, as an academic. Well, people in the past were building networks as well. And it's, it's through those networks that you get information you have access to materials outside of your region you might you might start to um, you know, create alliances between you and other folks that can be beneficial in any number of ways you know, alliances are, are wonderful things to have when they work and not so good when they don't so the way this works is think about when you let's say at Christmas and you have a favorite uncle, for example, and you spend months and months and months thinking about what am I going to give my favorite uncle for Christmas? And you spend a lot of time, invest a lot of yourself into this gift. Um, you may spend a lot of money on it, and you're really excited to give your favorite uncle this, this great gift that expresses how you feel and how important that person is to you in your life. And you give them that, and they open it up. They go, oh, that's a nice gift, right? But here, here's yours, and they give you your gift, and it's a gift card to Target, right? How do you feel when that happens? Right. Um, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, you're laughing. So, I'm, you know, we've yeah. touched on a nerve here, right? Yeah. So yeah. Better than it, not getting it, anything at all, I suppose. But. <laughs> I suppose, but, but do you feel at that point that if you, if, if you do this, and that's the result, you might start to question the relationship a little bit, that perhaps it's not quite the relationship that you thought. Right. Well, people in the past did this as well. Okay, so if you're living in a small-scale society, you need access to lots of other people. You may, you may live with 30, 30 people on a daily basis, but you can't support a society on 30 people. You have to have connections beyond that. So how do you build and maintain those connections? You do it through a number of you know, ceremonies, ritual, giving gifts, builds relationships. Claude Levi-Strauss has this famous uh, uh, mental experiment of, you know, you sit down at a cafe with another person is sharing your table and you offer him some wine or something. And now you've uh, created this, this need for reciprocity. You've offered something to him and, he now has an obligation, as Marcel Mose would point out, um, he has an obligation to reciprocate in some way. And if he doesn't, things get a little awkward, right? So you, you build these relationships through this, these acts of giving. It might be at a feast. It might be uh, you know, a meal. It might be any sorts of ways. But these, these relationships are built through acts of giving and, and reciprocating. And through that process, 
you also get to measure and balance the the relationship. Just like the example we had with the uncle giving you the gift card, now you know that that relationship isn't quite what you thought it was. And so you can adjust relationships or build them as as need be. And uh, so exchange theory looks at how people use these kind of opportunities to create alliances, to create uh, means of accessing information from distant sources, of being engaged in larger, uh, larger communities, and ultimately, likely in many cases, uh, intermarriage, where people are starting to intermarry. And that starts to build kin, re- kin relationships between, between groups, which are more, tend to be more robust than relationships built through you know, exchange and reciprocity. And we see this really taking place, uh, especially starting in a period around 3,000 years ago in the mid-continent of North America, uh, where people are starting to reach out and build these kind of relationships. And those relationships really are beneficial to the people who are engaged in them, but they're also costly. You have to put a lot of time and effort into maintaining those relationships. And uh, so it drives continued kind of, kind of but, but you also gain status through that relationship too. Other people in your community see you as a source for, for things as well. So you gain a lot through this, even though it might be fairly costly. So you're always trying to you know, balance out between the, the costs and benefits of building those relationships. But ultimately, um, they, they channel benefits to, to the people who are engaged in those kind of networks. And we see that really starting to take place around 3,000 years ago in the mid-continent. And by the time we get to Hopewell, uh, a thousand years later, it's, it's profound how they've built these kind of relationships. Uh, and these relationships extend long distances across, oh, a good two-thirds of North America, uh, which are uh, engaged in, in, in some way providing things into this Hopewell phenomena that's going on around 2000 to 1600 years ago. Yeah. And that's, what's so fascinating about it is when I think of the reciprocity and the exchange, uh, I naturally tend to think in small regions, you know, so in and around Ohio, in and around Indiana, you know, kind of the general regions right. along the river systems and things of that nature. But when I think about something coming from the Rockies in the form of obsidian or something all the way into a Hopewell Culture Center in Ohio. I can't help but wonder uh, how far does the reciprocity go? Um, And and what happens if somewhere along that chain between the source, say the Rockies and Ohio, uh, how do we account for an opposing group or an opposing nation who may not be in good terms with everyone else in that, that network? Well, I think that that's an excellent question. And I don't know that we've really teased that part out yet. Um, haven't seen too many, there are social barriers. I remember when I was, uh, when I was doing my dissertation work, uh, working in the, uh, essentially Northern Wisconsin and, uh, region, well, it's Northern Wisconsin and parts of the, uh, of the Western Upper Peninsula, sort of at the northern end of the Lake Michigan region and up into Lake Superior, that we were able to see that there are social barriers, that some people are not side by side, but they're not interacting with one another. And we could see that in the form of what sources of raw materials that they were using, and they were not trading or interacting in ways that move those materials from one, one group to the other. So that looked like there was a clear social boundary. So I'm certain that there are social boundaries out there that we do not know about right now, but uh, that, that we could probably tease out um, out of the data if we looked looked closely at it. But um, how do we deal with that? Well, some groups are engaged with that kind of uh, exchange system and interaction, and other groups are not. And you work around the ones that aren't and, <laughs> and keep going. Uh, I imagine there probably were situations where the established networks broke down at times. I, I, can, I can anticipate that there are, you know, any, any long period of time, you're going to have some, some uh, breakdown in the system. 
and I imagine there probably were. I just don't know that we have have looked closely enough uh, and have fine enough control over the chronology to be able to to be able to see see that. I mean, Hopewell's only around for a few centuries, so right. um, it's uh, it's a very short lived phenomenon. Certainly, a very very um, high visibility phenomenon, but very short lived phenomenon as well. So we we need some pretty good control over chronology. So again, uh, that idea of that long distance trade also puts me in mind of the potential for aggression toward high value items. So uh, whether it be a really good source stone for napping or a decorative material that may have been used, something like mica or, or shells or copper, as you've discussed, um, is there any indication, say, around Hopewell settlements of defensive structures or anything that would lead you to believe that there may have been a, a particular material that could have added to greed or the potential for war or conflict over those items? Well, that's a really amazing thing with Hopewell is that we don't see that. Uh, not in, in any, at least during the peak period of Hopewell. It seems like uh, I'd have to say that people felt to some extent that they were engaged in something bigger and there, there probably are belief systems involved with the movement of some of this material. You have to recognize too, that a lot of the stuff that's moving around in this Hopewell system is not long distance stuff. There are, there are raw materials for stone tool production, very high quality ones in Ohio. Um, and in in Indiana as well, and those are not long distance materials. They're I mean, not certainly not long long distance. Uh, they're not sort of the obsidian and copper and and uh, marine shell kind of things that we see with Hopewell. This is relatively regional or local, and there's a lot of movement of that probably going on as well. But we do see these longer distance things, and that seems to be something that is engaged in. Um, a system of belief or practice that people felt was important to their to their daily lives, and we don't see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of at least not in the classic Hopewell centers. We don't see a lot of the really prominent kind of conflict. We will see it later. <laughs> we certainly saw it before. So there there is there is warfare here in. in the mid-continent prehistorically, and and a lot of uh, a lot of conflict going on uh, right up through the late Archaic. But then it's sort of uh, during Hopewell times. We we don't see a lot of it in the classic Hopewell world. No fortified sites during that period of time, and, and things of that sort. Yeah, I find that very interesting. Now, something that I also have thought a lot about is uh, we tend to, in this conversation uh, in the past, we've always tend to talk about the items coming into those Hopewell centers, but what do we see in the opposite direction? How far out do we see something that can be attributed directly to Hopewell uh, as far as long distance trade goes? Well, we, we can see Hopewell-like things or Hopewell things going out uh, the Hopewell world kind of uh, the, the world that seems to be really engaged in Hopewell seems to go out maybe to the Eastern edge of the great plains and, and North into uh, there are some, some faint echoes of Hopewell all the way up into Northern Wisconsin, not much beyond that, but some, some, and they're very faint, <laughs> you know, oh, look, they used rocker stamping on their ceramics. They they're clearly part of the Hopewell world. The, uh, the kind of things going out from Hopewell that's bringing that stuff in, that's, I think that's somewhat um, escaping us at the moment. So I, I wonder if it's, if it's ideas more than, uh, more than anything else. Yeah, that's a great I think, point. I think that's probably where, where I would first focus my, my attention would be on the, the importance of ideas uh, and beliefs and, and things of that sort that, that, that are being shared. Yeah, and you know, Adina leading into Hopewell and, and everything that was associated around that general time period, it's always been an area of fascination for me. But just to make sure that we're all up to speed on the Hopewell themselves, um, let's talk a little bit about what we know of that culture. So obviously known for a very high art style and for monumental 
Earthworks. So uh, give us a little bit more background on the Hopewell themselves. What do you think made them so unique among all the other time periods that we see? Well, I'm going to focus most of my discussion on Ohio Hopewell, which uh, for some reason I've ended up knowing better than some of the other Hopewells. There are, there are Hopewell um, things going on all over uh, from Illinois to, all the way out to Kansas City and up into the upper Mississippi Valley and, uh, and into the lower Lake Michigan Basin. But I'm going to focus most of my response to your question there on central Ohio, primarily the, the Scioto Valley and the Paint Creek area south of Columbus between the Ohio River uh, on the southern border of Ohio and uh, north up to the Columbus area. And that's sort of the, the real area that Hopewell really is prominent. It's, it's, it's uh, as you mentioned, their, their art and uh, material culture is, is uh, really incredible. Other folks work with copper later on, like Mississippians will work with copper quite a bit. But I have yet to see any Mississippian copper that approaches the kind of artistic representation that, that Hopewell was doing, as well as some of their work in stone and, uh, and perishables. There, there is actually quite a bit of uh, Hopewell textiles left, and we can, some research has been done that shows that those, even though we can't see it today, those textiles were dyed and painted. Uh, and uh, and uh, so they're, they're very elaborate in their, in their art, in their, their artistic representation of, of their world and their beliefs. But the, the big thing that's going on there is, of course, these monumental earthworks. And uh, I, I don't think I can really express the scale of, of some of these things. They are massive. And they include things like uh, large octagonal and circular wall, walled-off enclosures uh, that enclose hundreds of acres. And then, of course, mounds, a lot of large conical mounds, many of which were used for, for burial, repeated burials of, of individuals in those things. And people are buried, of course, with some of these very elaborate uh, artistic items, um, um, and copper ear spools and silver ear spools. These are large ear ornaments that people, some people wore. I don't think everyone did, but some people wore them. And uh, breastplates made out of copper. Just this elaborate, and of course, obsidian, uh, obsidian bifaces, big, large obsidian knives and, and things that are quite large in scale. I mean, you know, a foot or so longer. Uh, I know of one copper axe that uh, it weighs about 40 pounds, just one ax head. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, you have to, you have to concentrate when you're getting ready to pick that one up. It, it's sure, not, yeah. I mean, it's not a small one. And so these elaborate things that, that, that pe- some people are buried with, but contrasting with that is the, the Hopewell settlements themselves. And, um, they've really kind of eluded us for, for a long time, just being able to try and find them because they are so small. A couple houses, you know, two, three, four houses in some of these settlements. Uh, and, and they're dispersed uh, across, the, uh, across the, the, the region. So what we've come to realize is that, at least in the Ohio Valley and probably elsewhere to, to more greater or lesser extents, the population is really in these dispersed little hamlets and farmsteads. They are growing crops that were actually domesticated here in Central North America and supplementing those crops or, or using the crops to supplement wild resources and, and hunting game. And it's this dispersed settlement. There, there are, are no large concentrated villages. You would think that the, the scale and monumentality of the earthworks drives you to think that this must be a really, really complex society with, uh, you know, with leaders and rulers and, and you know, power and all sorts of things, people being uh, told how to invest their labor. Um, because you think every, every basket full of dirt that went into that into those earthworks um, was labor that could have gone into feeding a family. And instead they're piling basketfuls of dirt up to make these. And by the way, it's not just dirt. They're being very 
careful about how they're piling that dirt and right. what kind of dirt they're using. Um, there's a lot of engineering that goes into these things. But every basket full of dirt that goes into those things is uh, labor that could have gone into feeding your family. Uh, so when you see that kind of thing, you think, well, somebody's making them do all this. But that's not there. It's, it's, it's really this dispersed, uh, relatively um, non-hierarchical population um, that is doing this because it means something to them. And they feel motivated to do it. One of the things that it's doing for them is that they're creating these large earthworks as centers where they can take these dispersed populations and bring them together in aggregate for all sorts of purposes, mortuary ceremony, other ritual behaviors. Um, um, and that's how you, how you create community, or at least one of your kinds of communities that you may have. So you create community by bringing these things in. And that's where this, these alliances and this long distance kind of exchange system comes into play because it's here where those really exotic materials come to play uh, a role in those, in those um, community kind of um, building uh, activities. Uh, and people are displaying these and using them in, in ways that are meaningful to these folks. And, you know, there are folks that try and tease out what that what that meaning will be. I'm not going to venture into that. I'm just going to say it's meaningful to them in some way. And uh, that's where the, the long-distance stuff is coming into play is in, in these gatherings where we're building community uh, through through activities that bring all these people together. Yeah, and you hit on so many great points there, and it's fascinating in, in so many ways because, you know, with the Hopewell, uh, what you just said there is, you know, there's not a, a central area, a central city, a, a large urban area that you would expect as you see later on with the Mississippian cultures. Right. Um, but yet the engineering of the earth mounds is so deliberate and set up in such a uh, exacting method that it makes me wonder who among that group of dispersed people was the engineers who had the knowledge of how to build these things, of the alignments of these things and where did they reside and what role did they play in the daily culture of the people and, and who had the power to assemble those people together at those places? Or was it just common knowledge that at a certain time of the year, this is where we're going to go to gather. I'm sure that played a point, but that's always been the big question mark with Hopewell for me is while they seem to be separated and in very small groups um, living amongst maybe family groups or extended family groups, yet there is a very high level of artistic ability. There's a high level of engineering and it's who are those people? Who are those people? <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great question. Who are those people, uh, and and what are they doing the rest of the year? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And and what was their role? You know, uh, somebody was was keeping uh, these trade uh, movements, these reciprocities coming in. Uh, I don't envision them just being dispersed among little family groups. I mean, there had to be some degree of management uh, of the goods coming in and coming out of the valley um, of the building of these incredible earthworks. And again, if you've never researched or looked into Hopewell earthworks in art, I encourage you to go do so. There's lots of examples online, but it is absolutely astounding. Uh, the things that they were able to accomplish. I had the opportunity to go to Mound City Mm -hmm. uh, a few of the different sites around Chillicothe and, and different areas, Serpent Mound, we kind of did a big, um, and I know those aren't all necessarily hope well, but just to be in that region and, and see the variety of earthworks and mounds and everything that is in that area is absolutely incredible. So uh, if you love archaeology, definitely go up there and check out uh, what these communities were able to accomplish. And so you know, you talk about the social networks and we talk about the movement of goods, but yet uh, we see those social networks. Are, are we able to trace uh, something like DNA or any indicators that, hey, this person is living uh, way over in uh, Western Indiana, but they appear to be of Hopewell origin? Is there anything along those lines that show the dispersal? 
We have not been able to do a lot of that. Now, there has been some recent research on um, dental cusp patterns that uh, that might open up some doors for us. But uh, of course, we're we're dealing with people's ancestors here, and they have um, they have living descendants. These people that were buried in in these uh, mortuary centers and the earthworks, uh, they have living descendants, and. Those living descendants have have expressed, of course, concerns about research that may be destructive to to the human remains. So uh, that gets us back to that ethics discussion we were having earlier, uh, where it, uh, it it's difficult to um, to uh, conduct some of the the research that. Uh, Perhaps we as scientists would like to answer some of those questions, but there are descendants of those people who say, we know who they are, we know our history, we don't, and, and they do in, in ways that are very meaningful to them. So we tend not to do a lot of that that kind of uh, research, certainly with, uh, with Hopewell and, and uh, many others, even though I think it could be, you know, uh, just from a, from a, dispassionate perspective uh, you know we could learn from that but is that worth the the, uh, the cost to the to the descendants that that would cause so uh, we have not done a lot of that but we have done some things with with network analysis for example which you you, you asked the question of who are these people that are you know that are doing all this you know, the, the, who are the people that are the engineers and the and the people who are controlling a lot of this this stuff we've done some network analysis uh with with raw materials that are moving around through through the hopewell system and of course some of this is relatively localish materials kind of you know, ohio some of it's a little more regional ohio indiana um maybe over to illinois um, and then there's the long distance scale where we're going out to the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast and the Rocky Mountains and the Great Lakes. And what we found is that most of the stuff from the local and the regional scale, about to say the Mississippi Valley and the Appalachian um, Plateau, um, most of that stuff is being managed, the, the, the exchange system for that is being managed at the household level. It's individual households that are doing this this. Um, building relationships and maintaining relationships and probably intermarriage and so on that that is a lot of the very core of hopewell is built at the at the household level and extended family level or the clan level or you know that however they're organizing themselves but it's it's at a very very intimate level it's only when we get out to the larger scale stuff the obsidian the copper the mica the marine shell that uh, the shark's teeth and so on that we start seeing something else taking place where it seems to not be uh, not be through the household level interactions that uh, that create those kind of relationships it's something more uh, more focused uh, and so there is a there's a level in there that I think we need to, that we can tease out who is running those larger scale relationships um, and how are those being structured? And is that, is that just one person whose networks just happen to get so big that they could go out that far and then they do it for everyone? Or uh, how does that work? Is there, is there, are there people who are recognized for their religious um, um, leadership, for example, or, or their power that use that to channel more distant things in. Uh, so I don't know that I have the answer to that. Uh, those are absolutely fascinating questions. But, uh, but one thing that we have been able to tease out is a lot of the core of Hopewell, this Hopewell exchange system throughout the, at the say, the Ohio Valley, from the, say, the Mississippi Valley over to the Appalachian Plateau, a lot of that seems to be households that are just interacting with other households over the region. And that seems to be channeling a lot of that stuff around. Yeah, again, it's it captures the imagination in so many ways. 
the sheer volume of it. And again, uh, someone with such a high artistic ability just really captures the imagination. But we can't, we would certainly be remiss if we uh, don't touch on the copper. Now, I know this is something that you have a real connection to, a real interest in. It's a part of your major areas of research. So let's talk a little bit about the copper coming down, the testing of it, and uh, you know everything from X-ray fluorescence to mass spectrometry. Uh, what are we seeing there? Talk about the copper and how we're able to test it, track it, trace it, all of those interesting things. Sure. Well, for the longest time, people have always, or people have long said, you know, copper is coming from Lake Superior. Not surprising because the world's largest deposits of native copper, of pure copper, are around Lake Superior. Um, And we've known that as long as there have been Europeans in North America. Uh, So, you know, the attention has long been on Lake Superior. So it's been assumed more often than demonstrated that uh, copper throughout North America is coming from Lake Superior. So I mentioned earlier that the Way back when I was with the Forest Service, I was standing on a site, and there was a lot. I was working on a site, and I was standing there. Just and the po- question popped into my head: um, There's so much copper at this site. Where is it going, and who's it going to, and and, and how is it getting there? Um, so there, that started me thinking. Well, how can we answer that question? Well, others have kind of tackled that a little bit in the past. We've used some methods um, uh, in the past. There were some assay techniques that were done as early as the late 19th century that people were were looking at trying to use uh, methods common to um, assaying minerals uh, to try to trace where copper is coming from. Um, And largely what they were able to determine was that this copper is coming from North America, not from Europe. Okay. A, we, we figured that out long ago, a century, over a century ago. And then we started using methods such as instrumental neutron activation analysis, um, which sadly requires a nuclear reactor to do. And not everyone has a nuclear reactor in their backyard, so it was really kind of hard for folks to do that. And uh, there were a few prominent studies back in the 1970s um, that really looked at that and, and were able to start answering some of the questions. But the real uh, gold standard today is a technique called uh, laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And that's a big long one. Uh, we, so we just call it LAICPMS for short. And what that does is that we use a, uh, a laser. Uh, to, uh, pardon my layman's terms here, I, I'll try and keep it where we can all understand this. <laughs> what the laser basically does is it vaporizes a small portion of the copper. And uh, that, and it's very small. We're talking about a sample that's less than the width of a human hair. So we have to use uh, microscopes and lasers to, to be able to do this. And the wonderful thing about this technique is that when you're done, you can't tell where you sampled the artifact. So it is destructive, but it's so minimally destructive that you can't see it when you're done. Um, Even under a microscope, it quickly disappears. So uh, we sample this very small sample, and that that copper is essentially captured into a stream that is fed into a mass spectrometer. And then the mass spectrometer measures how much of each different element is present in that copper. And we do about 30 some elements when when I do this. about I think I want to say about 34 is usually what I do, somewhere in that range. And what we find is about 99.9% of the material in in these copper artifacts is copper. It's actually more pure than the standard for pure copper. Uh, (laughs) This stuff is incredibly pure copper. But hiding in there... Uh, very small, minuscule trace elements of other things such as arsenic and iron and um, selenium and and mercury and uh, a wide range of others um, that are that are present in that copper. 
And those trace elements vary from one source to the other. So each raw material source has a slightly different, what we would call a compositional profile. So then the trick becomes you go out and you collect samples from those sources. You determine what the compositional profile of those sources happens to be. And then you go get the artifacts and you compare the compositional profile of the artifact with the compositional profile of the source. And that's what we've been able to do uh, quite a bit with laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which I should point out too, um, the, the work that we do, is, not everyone has a laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer in their backyard either. So uh, we work with... Uh, most of my research has been done through the elemental analysis facility at the Field Museum in Chicago. Okay. Uh, and they have, a, they have a wonderful, wonderful setup there. And that's sort of become sort of the center of, uh, of compositional analysis of copper these days. People working with a number of different sources have been working through the Field Museum recently. So the, the way in which it works. We figure out what the what the compositional profile of a source looks like, and then we compare the the uh, artifacts compositional profile with that source. Right. Simple. Yeah. Right? It's, um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's essentially a signature for the artifact of of origin. So, where do you see that Michigan and that surrounding area? It's, is that really the center for majority of what you're seeing with the Hopo culture? Yeah. Yeah. It is the, for the majority, but not all. And yeah. that's one of the fascinating things as we've learned is it's not where all the copper is coming from. There is copper coming from the Southern Appalachians. About 21% of our samples from Hopewell copper have proven to be Southern Appalachian copper. And there's a small group of uh, artifacts that we can't place anywhere. Don't know where they fit. They're outside of any of our known sources. Um, well, at least the known sources used in that study. This is not scary voodoo kind of things. It's just we don't have all the sources. Uh, there are sources in the Canadian Maritimes, and uh, we occasionally see stuff that might be maritime copper. But maritime copper can sometimes look like Appalachian copper, too. So we need more sources from uh, source data from the Appalachians up through the Maritimes. And I think that would be... Uh, be useful for us, but uh, about uh, 79, 80% of, uh, of the copper is coming from Lake Superior and Hopewell stuff that we've looked at so far. Yeah, very, very interesting. And yeah, we keep hearing uh, through different discussions about that Appalachian source of copper, and it's made its appearances several times uh, at different locations and different conversations that we've had. So uh, I know that sparked a lot of interest for people. And of course, you know, what you were talking about there with the unknown, it could certainly be an exhausted source or something that was just very small. Um, Of course, that happens with, with, uh, napping materials and and other other things as well so uh, nonetheless it's fascinating and it just adds to the mystery of the hope well and all of the things that they encompassed within that world we have been speaking tonight with dr mark hill professor of anthropology at ball state university now dr hill uh if someone wants to uh follow along with your work and uh possibly contact you for more information uh where can they find out more about what you are doing well, uh, the, the best way would just be to contact me at uh, Ball State, but uh, I, my work is published in uh, a number of journals, and uh, in fact, I'm working on some, some, uh, a new analysis of copper from, from Poverty Point down in the southern Mississippi Valley uh, right now, which I'll be presenting at the, um, at the Society for American Archaeology meeting um, next year. I believe that's in New Orleans, isn't it? It's in New Orleans next year. And uh, I do have a, an academia website as well that, that they could follow along there, which is probably the, the one that I keep more up to date than, than others. Um, so uh, check me out at Ball State University or on academia.com uh, or show up at the SAAs and talk to me there. 
Well, there you have it. So Thanks, if anyone Steve. out there uh, wants to follow along with what Dr. Hill is doing in this fascinating research, uh, there is all of your outlets for doing that. Uh, I would certainly be interested in uh, talking with you more about what you find from Poverty Point. We have just visited that incredible site. Uh, it was on my top you know, list, top three of places I wanted to go in North America. So we got down there. Uh, we did an episode on it with uh, Mark Brink, who is the um, manager there at the site. Uh, fantastic guy, wonderful site. And uh, again, something I would certainly be interested in. Uh, Dr. Hill, thank you so much for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. This was a fascinating discussion, and I definitely want to talk to you more in the future. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. As always, another incredible conversation. Jason, I got to give you kudos. You know, you keep hitting home runs. And uh, I also would like to mention something. You know, I've gotten a couple of emails from people in recent days, understandably, who have been asking, how come all three of you aren't on every episode these days? As you might have noticed, James Waldo wasn't in our intro and our outro this evening. I wasn't in the interview section this evening. But we are spread out these days, the seven ages research associates between three different states, perhaps three different states of mind. And over the course of the last year, I've also been dividing my time between Canada and the United States and Brazil, and who knows where else I may be, but just within the United States and its contiguous 48 alone, I spend most of my weekends on the road. And so trying to juggle and balance our schedules can be kind of difficult at times, But we still manage to make it work out. Anytime we are all available for any of our gatherings, especially our intros and our outros, but when there are, you know, conversations or interviews or things that we can all do together, we try to always do that. But I just wanted to address that because, you know, people do write from time to time and say, uh, where are you these days? What's going on? We're all here, but we're here in various places. Yet somehow we manage to make that space-time mystery of the cross-time pub happen. I do hope, honestly, between you and I, Jason... I do hope in the months ahead to take some time off from all the travel. I mean, it's wearing me out. Uh, As I mentioned, I celebrated my 40th birthday doing nothing because I don't get to do any nothing anymore. I am always going someplace. And at this stage in my life, I'm beginning to really feel it. It's taken a toll on my actual physical well-being and my mental well-being. I mean, the brain's kicking pretty hard still. But man, I, I, I feel the tire, you know. I have to go to bed every night at about 10 o'clock and then I'm up early you know, and I still feel a little tired. So I realize I'm going to have to slow down. I don't think I can just keep hitting it, you know, full throttle like I've been doing the last couple of years. And I hope that maybe with more time and uh, less time on the road, uh, I can spend some more time behind the mic with you doing these because it's, it's definitely something that we have endeavored to do. We have a passion for that we all love. And if we're going to be traveling, if I'm going to be traveling, I certainly would like to be out there looking for artifacts, looking for you know, fossils, heck, just enjoying nature with the Seven Ages Research Associates. We haven't been able to do that, the three of us, in quite a while. It's amazing we still got the podcasts going, but again, I just want to commend you for uh, doing everything you've been doing with the Patreon and just managing all aspects of this while I'm kind of doing the website maintenance. I was literally just doing website maintenance on the back end of our site yesterday, but we take great pride in our various areas that we occupy, still managing to keep this operation going and occasionally bringing in new voices. You know, Chase Pipe's a good friend of ours, longtime supporter of ours, and someone who we absolutely love and appreciate. And of course, all of the academics out there who also contribute to the message we try to provide, the education, the history, the archaeology, everything that we try to bring to people. So it's very much a unification of multidisciplinary elements and interests and people from all corners of space-time who bring this together and make it a very, very unique endeavor. So again, thank you, and thanks to everybody out there who helped to make this. And I hope that answers some questions. Rest assured, as often as we are able, and of course, as long as we are able, we will continue to provide you the very best in history and archaeology. So again, Jason, you keep up the good work, and I'm going to try and take some time off. (laughs) Well, let me officially welcome you to 40. Um, Being 45, I can tell you that it only gets better. (laughs) I've never had so many doctor appointments in my life, but nonetheless, um, you know, age is also a good thing because with that comes hopefully some knowledge. 
So uh, again, welcome to 40. And yes, the band is still together, as they say. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that because uh, I get, you know, messages as well. But a lot of people may not realize that, you know, we also have full time jobs. Um, Micah, more so than any of us, probably works about 70 or 80 hours a week sometimes. So uh, we do this in addition to everything else. I have two young children at three and six years old. Everybody's got things going on, but we try to bring you the very best in history and archaeology. And uh, again, it's something we love, something that we're passionate about. And when we have the opportunity to do it together, we certainly will. But uh, nonetheless, it's a, a passionate thing that we do and we love it. And we thank you all for the support. Well said, as always, and so well said, in fact, of course, that's going to probably be the final word for this edition of the podcast. Be sure to check us out online at sevenages.org. And again, thank you, Jason Pintrail, for all your hard work. James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire, wherever you are out there, and all of you for stopping by the Crosstime Pub to join us here. I'm Micah Hanks. We will catch you guys again next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.